Our roundtable podcast, I'm your boy, Corey G, Small Arms Danny, at Trey Speed, and the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. Today, we got Matt Wenning from Winning Straight. Here's the deal. Matt's backed it up on the platform for like 20 plus years. He got all the letters beside his name. He's killing it on content. He's in the outlaw community of conjugate, as we all are on this podcast. And so what I'm hoping by today is, one, you're going to get a lot smarter by listening to Matt, and we are too. Two, he's going to explain, hopefully, when I ask him certain questions, why some of the shit we do works that I can't explain. (laughs) And also hear some great stories, but I think we might have to start with the one we just heard that was not being recorded. (laughs) So, oh my gosh, yeah, and then we'll talk about some background. Matt, you said the first time you were getting ready to squat, 1,003, you had been around Westside for about a year. Mm. Tell everybody what happened, the person before you. So I had just moved, I just graduated with my master's degree in 05. Yeah. So I had been traveling back and forth to West Side three hours away when I could, which was about twice a month. Yeah. So I would squat with the PM crew with Chuck and them yeah, on yeah. Friday night, go stay at Louie's house, which was always a fucking treat. I'm sure. And then get up in the morning and bench with George and drive home. Okay. I did that for four or five years while I was going to college. So the first real meet that I do under the West Side Barbell full-time lifter yeah type deal um apf senior nationals in vegas like 06 and i go there and it's my first time i'm going to squat 1003 and not only do they do things in classes of weight but Mm -hmm. they also do them in alphabet okay so me and this other guy were both going to do 1003 but his name was alphabetically before mine so he goes under the bar freaks out about four to six inches down so he's still super high dumps it over the top of his head (laughs) and it's a brand new squat bar that's razor sharp and it I just see this like the blood just rip off of his scalp. The the spotters just drop so fast that they can't get their hands from underneath the bar. One guy rides it to the ground and snips his fucking fingers off with a thousand three. So he's standing like raw, like it's a fucking <laughs> Freddy Krueger. Hey, we're worried man. about when guys are taking too long getting their knee wraps on. Yeah, no this shit. motherfucker's let his, his fingers laying on the floor. <laughs> so the dude's fucking like, oh, you know, screaming. and <laughs> the, the, So they're trying to get the weight off and get the fingers. And then the medics come and take this guy away. And they're stripping it down to a, a feasible load to put back up on the rack. And Louie the whole time's blocking me. Don't watch this fucking shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? While they're taking off my wraps, <laughs> yeah. you know, to reset because they're going to give me however much time I want. Sure. Instead of going, you got one minute because I just watched the guy about fucking die. die. And um, so he's, so I remember him and Hussey come up to me. Hussey was, as far as at that time, Hussey and Louie were the two top power no coaches. Yeah. No question asked. And Hussey comes up to me, goes, you get this fucking shit. This is the baddest squad I've ever seen. <laughs> they come from Rick Hussey. Goes, it's pretty yeah, amazing. <laughs> you just watch somebody about fucking die. And you're going to take the same weight. So I get under there and I remember just being so fucking like nervous. Yeah. So I just make sure I just slow everything down. So that weight's stable. Cause it felt like wherever we were at at that time, I don't know if it was the ceiling height. Mm. We were in this massive ballroom that had like 30 foot ceilings. I think that was throwing guys off spatial awareness, spatial Mm. awareness where the balance was getting fucked up. So I pick it up and just, just control it and just dunk it and hit it and stand up and the crowd goes fucking crazy because they're thinking this is a shit show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was so I get it and I'm like I was, that was kind of solidified me as one of the badasses of that time. Hell yeah, <laughs> at Westside Barbell, you know. So that was an interesting uh, situation, but that was my first taste of a uh, multi-ply meat under the Westside Barbell banner was <laughs> watching somebody fucking die with the same weight I was getting ready to do. What? So what? A lot of people, obviously the. The mystique of West Side and just the craziness of guys like Chuck and yourself. And it's like p- people don't really understand an environment like that because it doesn't exist, right? Which is what we're trying to create in our morning crew. And it's like that competition, not that really everybody even likes each other. Everyone wants to be on that fucking board, take these world records. Like it's so lost in today's gym. Like, but it pushes you. And you did obviously extremely well on your own when you left West Side too, because that's when you hit a bunch of your numbers, Matt. Yeah. But it's like, Talk about how important training partners, environment, competition, and that that real, like, they call, I'm a dog. But that's like a fucking, like, for real, like, killer mentality that you are walking into every day. Sure. I mean, I, and to be honest with you, I mean, a lot of the reasons that I did so well when I left was because I took what I needed to take from there. Yeah, it makes as sense. As far as what you're asking, which is that intensity level, um, we all train together together so hard that going to meets was a fucking vacation. That's how we feel. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels fucking easy compared to what we do in the gym. And I think especially training with guys like Chuck and those dudes at the time, because 
when I was with Chuck at Westside, Chuck would already have broken eight or ten all-time squat world records in three different weight classes. <laughs> so you bring your fucking Wheaties <laughs> every you know, time. Like there was no like there was no like showing up. Wow, it's going to be a you know. And in some ways, this was very wrong. It was <laughs> you, you go in there. There's no fucking deload days. Every yeah. day, <laughs> every day is fucking grind city, and you couldn't have a real job. Yeah. You couldn't you couldn't work like a real person because you're at home basically wondering if you should go to the hospital every Friday. This isn't like, you know, and, and looking back now, what I learned from was what intensity it was going to need to be the world record holder. Yeah. But also, I also learned what not to do, which was build in the recuperation time. Yeah. And that's something that Louie and Chuck never learned. And I think that's a lot of reasons why Louie was always hampered with injuries yep. and Chuck was just so intensive that he could just work through injuries yeah in some ways not good yeah yeah so and you've been able to stay injury free pretty much your entire yeah, career I've, I've, I've tore a groin other than, and it was because I was dehydrated in Florida yeah other than that I've never really been hurt with the shit I've done and That's which is amazing. also why it makes me hard to still want to compete because I'm like I, I wondered felt, about that Matt <laughs> well I felt like how many times can you go to Vegas and be on the blackjack table and win 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 until you massively Facts. lose. Yeah. And for me now, I, I, I'm glad my knees and my back and my shoulders mm. are still healthy enough. I can still train hard. Yeah. And that's what's important to me. I fucking I, love it. If I compete, I become so, and this, the old West Side days, I, I don't mean to, but I become so fucking yeah. focused that nothing matters. Yeah. And when you start running a business, that's horrible. Mm. That balance is tricky. It's not easy. I, I'm, it's impossible for me to do. Mm -hmm. So until I can get to the point where everything's more re repli re replicable, yeah. where I don't have to be on my toes uh, mentally and physically mm -hmm. all the time with the business, then maybe it's time to sit down and consider doing some of that. But yeah. as of right now, I get so fucking drawn in from my experiences <laughs> yeah. from Louie and Westside of that yeah. focus. But what I try to tell people all the time is the reason that I had to learn what I know about training was because I had to, I did bench 500 when I was 19, That's but I didn't bench 550 until I was 24. Got it. It took me five years of grinding my fucking nuts off to go up 10 more percent. Mm. And then another three, four years to go up another 10%. The point is, is that you get to a certain strength level, no matter what that strength level is, it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's 225 to 250 yeah. or 500 to 550 on yeah. the bench those jumps are oftentimes educational purpose. I believe that. Meaning you don't know what the fuck you need right now at this particular time, and therefore your body's going to fight every step of the way to get better, which means the intensity is not the trick. It's the focus of where you're putting your energy at what, at what exercise, yeah. at what time. So, so if my arms are weak, but I keep focusing on pecs and shoulders, yeah. let's just use an example, then my bench is not going to move. I might feel better. I might look better. I might even every, occasionally break a PR in a weird lift, but when I go to the contest, it doesn't transfer. Mm -hmm. And that's the trick with conjugate is conjugate is a direct swallowing of pride to understanding you don't train what you like anymore. You train what you need. Yeah. <laughs> and the shit that's hard. And it's the real. shit that you don't want to do. We just went through a whole deficit cycle. Uh, and because deficit <clears throat> conventional, there ain't all these guys are, it's hard for fucking every one of my fucking guys. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, so you go uh deficit. Uh, we went straight weight, a red, a black, and then double reds. That mm -hmm. was our four week wave. And you, but you could see guys get better each week and more comfortable next week. We're going to take a weight and see how we feel. And it's like, you know, I, I went to a couple of the guys. I'm like, dude, I know you're good at sumo, but you need to go through this in a conventional manner, give your hips a little break, like sure. start to work on your back. Like, and that's the thing is like, I know Louie would always talk about fucking doing good mornings. Guys didn't want to do them, <clears throat> but they made you fucking mean and strong hurts half the guys sometimes though, too. And I can't really program them for like the gen pop either. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, that if you make a fucking record there, yeah. that you're, that you're going to, you're going to feel well it. in the good morning too, is, is if you think about most people's weaknesses, it's going to glare it. Big time. You know, if your hamstrings are not equal to your quads, you're going to see it in a good morning because you're going to bend your knee at the bottom really mm. far and turn it into a squat. If it's your glutes, you're going to have problems at three quarters of the way up locking it out. And if it's your lower back, your lower back's going to get fucking injured doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course, it's if true. most people's posterior is one one section of that's their weakness, they don't want to touch good mornings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to showcase it big time. Right. So, we <laughs> utilize, I mean, but there's a point of no return, and this is – 
at the world class level, I got up to where I could do 585 for a triple on good mornings mm -hmm. and it was cake. But <laughs> after that, I'm not, I'm not even shitting you. Never bothered me. Yeah. But here's the point though, is that when I could do 500 for three, it transferred over to my deadlift. When I moved it up another almost hundred pounds, point in return. It, it only gave me 15 or 20 more pounds on my PR. So there's a point where again, my posterior chain wasn't my weakness anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you that's the hardest part, I think, with the conjugate and why everybody wants a more simplistic view of how to train is that conjugate forces you to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it all the time to create a more educated base. But the problem is, as we, as we know, strength training doesn't necessarily attract the smartest fucking it doesn't it a smart guy is going to go why am i going to put all this time and energy into this and win a medal when i can put all this time and energy into this and make a hundred thousand dollars a year yeah that's true and that makes sense but for the some of us we don't care about that we want to be the best we can be yeah and that but that's rare yeah it is you rare. know and i mean i see it every day with everybody that i train you know they want to get to a certain point but what are you willing to give up to be there mm -hmm. you know i spent my entire 20s not given two shits about how much money I had. It was all about breaking world records. Yeah. Period. Even <clears> into my thirties, which I could have made way more money. I could have done way different things, turned down huge jobs. Mm -hmm. But for me, that was, I only knew I had one window of my genetic prime. Yeah. And I didn't give a shit how much money it was. You don't buy that back. You can't No, That's legitimacy that you, you can't, you, you know. can't purchase. Well, mine's the opposite, right? Is I because I bounced back and forth between bodybuilding and powerlifting so much too and the fitness shit I used to do, I thought my game was going to be outlasting motherfuckers, that I would be able to get my records in my as masters, which is what I'm starting to be able to like kind of sniff a little bit. And so I think my run's going to be late because I honestly think genetically when I was younger, I really I couldn't compete. I wasn't strong enough, especially because I didn't just focus on that. Sure. But it's like now I'm looking at like and inspired by older athletes too, right? And I'm like, all right, I'm seeing these – dude – my one squat <clears throat> as a master, I'm 16th overall tested, not tested. Jason Coker's number one. I'm on the same screen. Like, to me, that's like, you know, in, in uh, Bardinelli, yeah. who's a fucking Angelo Bardinelli, a fucking Westside legend back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. So I start to see, like, all right, G, you just got to stay in the game a yeah. little longer if that's the way. But So it's like, and those are super important to me, and I think that's the one thing that a lot of people never realize about me. These dudes do because they're with me all the time. But, like, it's so important to me, just as important as you said, but it was like, that's why I was willing to get up at fucking three in the morning. Cause I couldn't fit in any other time. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the business took away or when I would bounce back and forth, but at the end of the day, powerlifting and the numbers. And I think that's why Louie took time with me is because he knew once he actually got to know me, how much I really cared about it. Sure. And that's why I'm still doing it. Cause I've squatted 700 the first time in 2010 and then just squat at 220. And then I just squatted 694 and a half at 181 you know, fucking this year, a couple yeah. of months ago, a day after a bodybuilding show. Sure. And so it's like one of those things where what I liked about any of those guys, George, Mike Wolf, Tony, the, the list goes on, Joe Bayless, any of these guys have helped me. It's like, because I just wasn't going nowhere. They're mm -hmm. like, all right, this isn't like a dude that just came over because he wanted to be able to say he stepped in the gym one day. Every time I'd go to meet, I'd call Mike, I called Tony, George, hey, I need some help with the bench. I start coming on Sundays again. You know, I yeah. couldn't go there all the time, nor did I even act like I was a full-time member, but I was just around for like a decade mm -hmm. off and on. And the first time uh, when I hurt my shoulder real bad, he was top three guys on the list I went to see. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to some, well, I went to Serrano, but he's a, he's yeah. his own type of doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw Serrano, I went and saw Louie, and I went and saw Matt. You know what I mean? These guys uh, are leading the charge on so many ways and they're all right here. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, I don't know. I just feel blessed to have the resources that are, th that are in Columbus. And when I moved <clears> here, <throat> I had no clue any of it was here. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the Arnold classic was here. I didn't know West side Barbo was here. Yeah. I wish I did it on purpose. <clears throat> See, mine was backwards because I was already a good lifter in Indiana, but I, I only reason I knew Louie was because of powerlifting USA. There you go. And I was reading the, the articles and they were starting to blow my mind because I'm looking at it going, well, he's talking about getting faster to get stronger. Mm. And that, in my mind, as a teenager, made no sense. But it intrigued me. And then I started seeing things on chains, things that I just didn't have access to at the time. And uh, so I, I come over to the Arnold around 98. And I come over with a, a friend that worked with my mom. And we see George and Louie and Dave Tate and everybody walking out of the Arnold when they had the, the bench bash for cash yeah. in the main stage. And... He pushes me over. He goes, dude, you got to go talk to him. You got to, you've maxed out what you're going to be able to do in Indiana. 
you need to be around guys that are stronger than you. And so I finally push over and ask him, you know, you're talking, I was a bigger kid for that age, but you're talking guys in this, in this group that's walking out six or eight of them. All of them are world record holders. <laughs> yeah. All of them are the guys you see in the magazine pictures. All it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's intimidating. And so I go up and talk to Louie and he's like, yeah, you seem pretty strong. Why don't you come by sometime? You know? So the trip to Columbus, I was driving three hours one way to train with the guys. And once Louie saw I do that month in and month out, he started to realize not only was I strong, I was fucking serious. And he started to get the stars in his eyes because he knew I was in school for it. Yeah. <laughs> so now it gives him validity because now between 05 and 07, I'm writing most of the articles, whether it's my name or Louie's name on them. Yeah. Because I had the science background. It. And I could write very similar to what Louie wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, it was an interesting time. It definitely definitely opened up my mind but i you know that's the exact reason i moved here yeah it just ended up being fire departments and uh, you know i would say for the midwest uh, columbus is probably the best economy as far as a oh. city is concerned in a 300 mile radius of here yeah, yeah you for know? sure so if you're west virginia western pa southern michigan indiana maybe eastern illinois Mich kentucky mm -hmm. columbus is the place to be as far as economy is concerned and yeah. I would say 10 years ago, lifters. Yeah, for sure. You know, I wouldn't say now that it has the same mystique that it had in 2000, say three. Yeah. Just because, you know, Louis gym was still in its prime prime at that time. But, um, you know, you still got Dave, you still got you, you still got me. rogue, you got rogue. You know what I mean? So it's like, it just keeps stacking up of what's here in the Arnold classic still mm -hmm. too. I know all the guys got some questions, whether it's stories, whether it's training yeah. questions, Kawano, you yeah. had some questions. So yeah, me, myself and Treyway over there, we're big bench guys, right? And you've been able to bench 500 like for a long time, right? Yeah. So like what, 20 years. <laughs> yeah. What, what and and speed work is one of the m more interesting things that we talk about because I personally love speed work. I was watching your stuff. I was watching how you're doing and everything like that. Loading up the bar fast. Some guys don't want to do it. They don't believe in it. So like, what's do like should people be doing speed work? On These bench? guys are all, all yeah. raw lifters here too. Absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. well, I mean, you know, I've been a raw lifter for almost exactly. 10 years. Well, that now. was the thing is the old guys were raw lifters and they just threw gear on before the meet. Yeah. A lot of people, that's what people that. don't realize yeah. is like George and I watched George Halbert bench 630 at 220 raw when he did 766 in a shirt. I watched him one Sunday, no shit, go 275, double purples, and it was faster than I think I could bench a plate. Mm -hmm. And I was in fucking shock, Matt. He was literally probably, other than Maddox, the most explosive guy off the chest I've ever seen. The reason that you train speed work, whether you want to believe it or not, is because <laughs> I love that <laughs> is because of the force equation. So acceleration is one of the key components to force output. So if all you believe is the M part of the equation, so F equals M times A, simplistic in a simplistic fashion, the M is how much mass. Mm -hmm. So that means heavy. The A means the accelerative property of that to create force. So when you're training the speed bench, there's a handful of things that it does, and the reason it's important. One, internal, external motor unit coordination. So can the muscle coordinate itself and coordinate in synchronicity with all the other muscles mm. around it? So it's a way to get to high force output without mass. So if you look at the old Bulgarian system that was developed somewhere in the 60s all the way to the 70s, they didn't believe in speed work either. Max, max, max all the time, heavy as fuck. But the problem is they'd start off with 2,000 lifters in one class and they'd break it down until there was about three left for the Olympics. Because all three of the kids would actually withstand the ball. They can withstand it. So yeah. basically they're looking for the Bo Jacksons. Yep. Which none of us are. Correct. Okay. So we just get that out. In the <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you I know, wish I was Deion Sanders, yeah, but I'm not. Don't we all. So the thing of it is, is that's one thing you have to keep in mind. Internal, external motor coordination. The second thing is the ability to innervate fibers at a faster rate. So if you were to look at the um, graph of when it would take to get to maximal motor unit recruitment, the average person is going to have to strain on something from anywhere from four to six seconds before maximal recruitment is okay. attained. When you train speed work, you get to those motor units faster, which gives you a better chance in order to accomplish the weight. Because as Louie would tell you, and I would tell you, maximum weights, what happens is you eventually run out of time to be able so, to yeah. complete the fucking lift. Mm -hmm. So if you have to say 500 on the bench, and you can move it with ferocity, you're beating it because you're beating it with less time. To get to those motor units, you have to get there faster. 
So the point is, it's kind of like you can't lift big weights slow. It's yep. hard to win a hundred meter dash if the first fifty meters you're just building up speed. <laughs> there you go. Right, and yeah. then you're only fast at the very end. What you need to be able to do is boom, get out of the gate, and then sustain that pressure for eight nine seconds it's the same thing with a fucking squat if you can get to maximal motor unit recruitment at a quick fashion which is all neurological it's not at the cell it's at the neuron once that happens then you can innervate fibers quicker and now you're stronger because you can complete weights faster <clears throat> Mm -hmm. That's why you do speed work. I'm fucking yeah, smarter so, right now. So I am best. fucking smarter and, you know right what? now. And you know what? Whenever <laughs> this is this is the fuck I'm talking yeah. about, when, Matt. Whenever I bench uh, 350 at 81 down at the Edison meet, yeah. I was I I I attribute to benching that because of speed work because yeah. I knew I was fast off my chest and if I got the lift, uh, the if 350 they, was fast. If yeah. I got it fast up to right here, I yeah. could easily lock it out. That's why I bang all yeah. the triceps. You already created and now. It. The third thing is you're creating compensatory acceleration, which was Dr. Fred Hatfield talking okay. about for years. And that is quickness beats heavy weights. Mm -hmm. So why I, I always use this analogy. It makes perfect sense to me. It will to you guys too. If you're driving your car down the highway and you got the crew set at 65, why does it get better gas miles than in the city? It's already moving. <laughs> okay. Now here's the thing. If I'm applying the brakes, down the highway and let's just say the cruise control won't shut off it mm. just tries to maintain speed how much harder does it have to work this is why bands and chains are needed for speed work Got it. because you create so much compensatory acceleration that you miss part of the strength curve because you've already beat the weight and now it's just flying to the top which we know heavyweights mm. do not do yeah, yeah, yeah so when you hook a band and a chain onto something you're actually changing the force velocity curve and forcing the muscles to basically keep accelerating while the brakes are being applied. Got it. So the muscles work harder for the same amount of reps. Now here's where people screw up. When you do speed work, right when you're done, all of your accessory work needs to go down into tempos, okay. i.e. three, three, mm. five, five. You've already smashed that neurological conjunction Got it. with the fast fibers. Now you need to slow down and fix your grinding power with the accessory muscles that you think are going to be the weakest link, which is probably lats and triceps. When you say three, three, five, five, you mean like tempo is so, like one, so two, three. So like one, I two, okay. three. Yeah, so if I was sure. doing tricep push downs instead yeah. of just getting them Slow. done, I would one, two, three, one, two, three. I got it. Because I've already done this contraction yep. at maximum. So the body's got enough information to get better doing that. Now you have to change the book. Yeah. Give the muscle a different book to read, and now you'll have higher progression. Makes sense. So the problem with speed work is you'll start to see if you back away and don't watch anybody that they start to do too much quickness with everything that day. And they're not focusing on building the grinding power, which is the max effort day for sure. Yeah. But you have to isolate it in those muscle groups, even that workout. So if you watch me do triceps on speed day, I will do them very slow because what I'll know is when I max, it's going to be like, boom here. Yeah, right? of course. Yep, yep. Well, if you're only good at pow, then what ends up happening is when it you ain't got pow, <laughs> it doesn't seem transferable, mm -hmm. but it is on a secondary on the backside. So that, I've never heard anybody explain it that way. That does it make great. sense? Yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. It makes I also, a ton of sense. I also think that it helps with like technique. It yeah. like whenever well, I was doing speed work, yeah. every time I would set up, I would practice my setup, practice the arch, get set up. Mm -hmm. That that helped me out a ton. Talk well, to me about stretch reflex then too. Yeah. That's the one thing that a lot of people like Ramos and George would talk to me about. And I watched, I think even like a couple years ago, George still was benching like 500. It would just be like a fucking spring, dude. Mm -hmm. The way he would load it and it would be like, well, he'd start it. Well, back to your, back to your question before that leads yeah. into that really well. In my opinion, on a basic, on a basic standard, there's three ways you can make something more difficult i.e. give you more benefit mm -hmm. you can make it heavier you can make it faster or you can make it awkward yeah so if i do chaotic training it teaches me to stay tight but I, my form has to be perfect because if i fuck up you eat it say i'm doing <laughs> hanging kettlebells right i'm gonna eat the fucking floor yeah <laughs> on the other side of it if i do something insanely fast to do that the motor pattern has to be perfect because it's so quick it's almost instinctive mm -hmm. so the speed work treat teaches you to have instinctive perfection of motor pattern that's the fourth thing that speed work does, right? So back to your question on stretch reflex. Muscle action, we all think, I mean, most people, and I even did before I was highly educated, that 
Muscle action is the, you know, the, the spindles grabbing each other and pulling actus and mycin. Mm -hmm. Cross bridge, which is basically fingers grabbing and pulling at microscopic levels. I didn't to, know that, but I know it. Good. To yeah. cause <laughs> contraction. So basically you have the sliding filament theory. So that basically means this part grabs this and pulls chemically, either concentrically or eccentrically to okay. make you move. Stretch reflex is actually 30 to 40% of your actual strength, which does not really... Uh, entail um, actus and mice and cross bridging. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is that the tendon itself stores energy like a coil. Got it. Like a big car. That's what it feels when you yeah. hit it right too. Like yep. a car spring. That is neurological control of soft tissue, mm. not muscle, but it works with muscle. So why are these NBA basketball players have these amazing verticals and their fucking calves yeah, are, little as are smaller yeah. than my wrist? <laughs> yeah. It's all tendon. Got it. So the tendon actually stores kinetic energy and re can retrieve it or not retrieve it based on two factors, trainability and genetics. Okay. So some people will just naturally have it. Other people have to work for it. And sometimes they're never going to be any good at it. I That's mean, how many guys you've seen that are strong, but they can't dunk. Yeah. Or lot. vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can dunk, but they're weak as dog shit. Or I would just see like, I think once I felt it load up once. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, wait, that's different. Like, yeah. I remember just practicing maybe this is good or bad, <laughs> literally just loading the bar as fast as possible and mm -hmm. dro dropping it. Yeah. Partly because I had a part of that shoulder was already ripped and I didn't realize it. So when I loaded the bar slow, I felt like I couldn't load it the right way. So I kind of did it on accident. Remember when I yep. used to do, I'd take 315 out and I just <laughs> like this. And it would literally, as soon as they'd say press, return right back just as fucking fast. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I wasn't even using any muscle power. So what you're doing is, is if you're skilled, like yeah. you watch Maddox do it, he takes, you know, 780 and just drops it. Yeah. Now, the reason he's doing that is for two reasons. One, he's storing an immense amount of kinetic energy, actually more mm. than what the bar weighs. So it's fucking crazy. Think about this, right? <laughs> let's say, let's just say the phone, this phone weighs five pounds. Yeah. And I place it on my knee, right? No yeah. big deal. But if I take it six feet up and drop it, it probably breaks my knee. Uh, it's the yeah, same yeah. weight. It's, a little, yeah, it's I got velocity. You. So when you're training speed work going down in, in a high velocity, is going to help you learn to store kinetic energy if it's the proper percentage of weight. Mm. But yeah. here's the thing. No one does the proper percentage, yeah. I guarantee. Nobody <laughs> does the proper percentage, number one. And number two, what's the goal? So for most people listening, they're going to be like, well, I want to build muscle. Well, what we're talking about right now will not build yeah. any type of bodybuilding or aesthetic type muscle. So how do you synchronize both things to help with all yeah. factors? Here's how you do it. Controlled eccentrics with pauses with fast concentric. Okay. Now you have the explosive power on the upward phase, but you have the time under tension on the downward phase. So now you're getting all the muscle benefit, and then on the way up, you're getting all the tendon benefit. So it just depends on what you're trying to work for. Now, let's say he's a wrestler and he doesn't want to weigh more than 165. Mm -hmm. So we would train him more velocity based speed work sure where we're trying to move quickly because we want to store kinetic energy we don't want him to, to stay in the on. weight class exactly mm. so depending on if you're trying to gain weight lose weight get faster or your goal is pure athleticism or aesthetics you can make the skeleton of conjugate work very well for you if you understand the pieces and parts that are involved no, that's fucking that's fucking awesome right this is great why why are people so scared of fucking conjugate because it's a realization that you have to work your weaknesses yeah that's <laughs> I mean, probably a lot of self-awareness. Yeah, it, it starts in school. It starts with our parents, and I'm not yeah. being an asshole. But here's the thing: if I'm if I'm a a, stu a a teacher in third grade, and I understand that this kid really struggles at math, but he's really good at say English, I'm going to push him to his strengths. Yeah, and I'm going to let him glide on his weaknesses. Conjugates the ex exact reverse. Yeah, if you want to get great, you got yeah. to fucking work. Well, even that, but even if you want to be structurally sound, mm -hmm. so. Say I like to train quads because I want my legs to look like Tom Platt's, but I <laughs> yeah. avoid my hamstrings yeah. because they suck when I train them and I hate them. Well, eventually that's going to hamper the growth of the front side because the back side's imbalanced. Mm -hmm. So the reason conjugate is difficult is because your library of exercises needs to be vast. Yeah, sure. So that means your equipment availability needs to be fairly high, mm -hmm. one. Two, you have to know your weaknesses and be willing to train them. And three, you have to have an understanding of basic physics in order to utilize the training properly. Mm. We're just talking about mass equals, you know, force equals mass times acceleration. And most people have never even thought of training in that fashion. No. 
So my point is, is it brings out everyone's insecurities. And as we know, most people that get attracted to weights are hiding already from insecurities. <laughs> yeah, so that, now yeah, yeah, they're, they're trying to be more. Yep. Yeah, for they're, sure. Yeah, they're not <laughs> alpha. So they want to be alpha. Yeah, they're yeah. not they're not strong. So they want to be strong. So now I'm going to give you a program that's going to bring out all the things you hate. Yeah. And all the things you avoid. It's so good. It's exactly why yeah. nobody fucking does it. Well, but, I'm obsessed with programming and learn mostly the stuff in the gym by trying stuff or reading or listening to you guys or learn stuff at Westside. But it's like. I know that my the academic side is not super strong. So when I hear it broken down like that, a lot of times I feel things working and know they're working before I can yeah. explain them because I'm more of a practical application. Well, I've always been that way. Everything starts off in bro science. I don't give a fuck right? what anybody says. Thank you. If you look <laughs> at if you look at even the way the Russians were training, I'll, I'll give you a really good story that came firsthand from Verkashansky to okay. me directly. I fucking love it. So for those of you that don't know, Verkashansky was a great Olympic uh, uh athlete in the 40s in the 50s he creates he gets his phd and master of sport so this dude's like freaky smart okay like blows me louie everybody away the the long end of the sh the short end of the story was is that we were talking and i go well, how did you figure out that lifting weights and jumping was going to help track because he's the dude that invented plyometrics yeah yeah, yeah. so just think <laughs> no about big that. deal mm -hmm. no big deal trey this, ran track in college yeah, this, fucking, <laughs> yeah. this fucking guy invented plyometrics <laughs> And so I go, he goes, it's a really interesting story. He goes, um, we didn't have a lot of funding because the Soviets at the early 50s were not really interested in the Olympics yet. Got it. They actually got interested in the Olympics from Paul Anderson. Mm, Paul Anderson came yeah. and did a lifting exhibition in so Moscow strong. in 1952 or three. He's like an 800 pound squatter or something, right? 1200. 1200. Okay. He yeah, squatted 1200. I'll fuck myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, well, that's fine. But so in <laughs> Vegas, so he was the first man to clean and press over 400 in the Olympics. Okay. Okay. So think about that. Yeah. Number two, he squatted a thousand pounds on the hour, every hour for eight hours in Vegas in the fifties. In the fifties. In a probably pair of fucking like Just boxer look, briefs. <laughs> look him up and you'll lose your mind. He's yeah. the first guy to really not understand yeah. conjugate. People thought he was a fucking idiot. <laughs> so here's what I'm saying in his backyard, he Dug Put, out, that's right. He dug out pits I and would fill 60-gallon drums full of different amounts of concrete and then measure it and get it perfect. And so what he figured out was is that training to a certain depth all the time was not advantageous to gaining long-term strength. Yep. So he'd have deep squats, high squats, and he would They're play. They're his fucking yard. So he's <laughs> playing around with conjugate, but without knowing it. Starting off as just some hill jack in the back going, so hey, I got an idea. Let's try this, that's right? So <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> so the Soviets see... Paul Anderson in all of his glory of like, holy fuck, this dude's insane. Yeah. That's when their attraction to the Olympic lifting and when they went to out see and find Alexiev and all those other badasses, wow. right? So long story short is right before that happened, Verkashansky gets snowed out from track. Obviously they're in fucking Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The winners <laughs> rocky the shit. winners make ours look like the fucking Bahamas, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so they can't they can't go practice any of their sports out on the track and they don't have indoor tracks. Yeah. So he's like, well, I guess we're just going to make do with the time we have. And we had a, a basement that had connected to the barracks, um, a weight room and some plyo boxes. Mm. So they're playing with this and the, the winter's bad for, I think he said, three to five weeks. They're not doing any sports specific shit at all. They go back out to the track when the weather clears and within a week or two, everybody does better. And he's like, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> because before that, everything's specific. Yeah, you want to be a triple jumper? What do you do? Triple, triple jump, jump all the fucking time. If you want to be a pole vaulter, you pole vault all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. He didn't have access to it, so he's doing jumps and barbell squats and some different plyometrics comes back, and all the guys are better at their sport. The beginning of conjugate so good. and cross-training evolves. So as they sense this, and as Zatsiorski has, or Verkashansky has um, the um, background and PhD, yeah. he's not only experimenting, he's studying at a high level. And so as this progresses, within the next five to six years, they have 1,000 researchers at Moscow alone for strength sports. Wow. 1,000. <laughs> so 1,000 guys in each little area. That's muscle, all they're doing cell, all physiology, day. physiology, nutrition, biomechanics. I mean, all these little areas they're focusing and studying with Zatsyorsky, Verkashansky, and Medvedev at the very top. So Mevdiev was kind of more of a static. Rocky Four was happening basically, yeah, yeah. but but reversed. Yeah. They didn't have anything. They had all this 
medical science stuff they were doing, but their training halls were like your gym and my gym. Yeah. They're pretty basic. And an average person walked in and go, you guys have world record holders here? Yeah. You know, kind of like when you first walk into West Side. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, place is a shithole. There's oh, no yeah. way. There's guys like all the weights are, are on the ground. <laughs> right? So that's how it started. And Verkish, that's how Verkashansky first figured out that specifically training for a common goal is not necessarily the best way to do it. You need to figure out the roundabout way to really create the true performance base that you're possibly could achieve. And so wow. that's where it starts. It's <clears> fucking <throat> unbelievable. I always just, the other thing too that we talk about kind of a lot is the whole RPE thing. And I know that people are rating their exertion or whatever, but I, I don't really, I think the, the reason why I like conjugate is partly because of the way my brain works too, is that I know it's this variation and I'm going to give you 100% of what I got today. Sure. And yes, I'm going to try to beat it by a chip. And I probably have an old PR. And maybe I have more of a newer one because I'm coming off injury. Whatever. There's all those things at play, right? But I think that I just could understand. I'm going to give you maximum effort at that deficit or this lift. And I'm going to give you. And I'm trying to beat that fucking guy and this guy. And that I'm not really worried to say, well, I'm going to stop at an eight today. Now, there might be like, I'm going to cut one short because I got this going on or this bugging yeah. me. And I, so maybe you're doing that. But I, I don't know how you feel about that whole situation. I fucking hate it, but yeah. maybe, maybe I don't know. What, what's your view on that in general? Well, I mean, I'm trying not, I feel like people are getting fucking softer out here, bro. They are. They're, <laughs> they are. The RPE is the best and worst thing that could possibly happen. And I actually okay. have a chapter I'm writing in my new book for it. Um, I believe that as a beginner and intermediate lifter that you probably need to base your things on percentages. And the reason being is you don't truly know what your strength is anyway. Yeah. So there's that in one side. Now, the other side is that self-regulation. So they know that from, I want to say around 65, they studied thousands of athletes in the Soviet Union and figured out that strength is variable up to 10% per day, no matter how many yeah. variables you, stra you straighten out. Meaning that let's say today you can bench 405. Well, tomorrow you might only bench 370. And the day after that, you might bench 415. Just what it is. It's, it's not absolute. These yeah. percentages are never absolute because you're never perfect. And the reason Stressors, is because there's all kinds of shit. Well, and training creates deficit. Yeah. So if you want super compensation before you get better, you got to dig a fucking hole. If you want to make a mountain, you got to find the dirt, mm -hmm. right? So when you dig that hole, you should be at a deficit until you super compensate, i.e. deload. Then you see the mountain you've built. Got it. So again, how do you, how are you at 101% if you're training correctly? So what they realized was, is that max effort was actually anything above 90%. I got it. Okay. So although it's very good to try to push records in the beginning and intermediate stages, you have to plan your records as you become advanced because you probably are at neurological maximum once you're good. Yeah. So again, if all of us go to the gym right now and we absolutely max squat, I'm probably going to hit 95% of my fibers, but some of you guys are only going to hit 75, no matter what you do. Yeah, so just, who's just, more beat up me yeah. because my max is truly my max. But the problem is it may take 10 years of training before you can innervate those fibers. So you have these built in neurological governors. Yeah. So, okay. Your car, for example, has a computer and in that computer, it sets a point where it realizes that the engine is going to fucking Perceive explode. threat, right? <laughs> so let's say my engine redlines at 6,500 RPM. Well, at 6,500 RPM, the computer is going to fucking stall it because mm -hmm. it's not going to let it go past that. Your body does the same fucking thing neurologically. Over time, as you train and become more comfortable with heavier <laughs> weights, those governors start to shut off. Ramos is explaining that to me because he saw me the last like year or so, and he's like, there's a lot there g it's starting to click mm -hmm. and i can feel it as i'm going back into raw and all the bands i mean we took look the bands this week were 460 pounds of bands and you see the guys like we used to do we do doubled up reds or blacks here just because it's easier than choking the bigger Absolutely. bands and no one else can fucking do that that's the thing is i would watch that <laughs> stuff at louis i'm like nobody <laughs> following me online has this shit at home well I, i'll <laughs> give you a story on that real quick yeah. so we're the probably the craziest band squad i ever saw at west side it was me chuck Vlad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 12, squad 1200. The first, the first yeah. 1250 squatter. <laughs> yeah. And and then also squatted what, like 1150 and just knee wraps. Yeah. yeah he's insane. Okay. Fucks. Yeah. Don't even. <laughs> yeah. Dude's the baddest squatter of all time. Yeah. No question. No question. 
as far as especially super heavyweight. So me, him, and Greg Panora. <laughs> yeah, Greg's so okay. Strong. So and Greg was a eleven hundred pound squatter at two forty two. Yeah. So we're all squatting together. Nice squad. We do we do two blues and a green. Yes. Which is five hundred and fifty pounds yep. of true brand new band tension around a fucking monolith base. Well, a lot of people don't realize that there around was around a four by four. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say that that was when I so, went there, I didn't realize all this shit was stacked up down there. So too. I get there one time and I'm like, Louie, what how much fucking band tension is this? Because it's going around a six by six piece of steel and then a six by six <laughs> piece of wood, and I'm like that's not how they were supposed Each to be. Each blue is like 220. And Chuck's like, Chuck's like, I need to wait to be about what it is at the bottom. And I'm like, okay, fuck, here we go. <laughs> so we, we start loading it up and um, Greg and I do a plate. So now you're looking at 650. <laughs> the first plate on the bar. And no one yeah. takes quarters. That's, yeah. that's set fucking one. Set two, two plates. Now you're at 750. Set three, you're at three plates, so it's supposed to be 325. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's fucking 725, set three. <laughs> then it goes to 800, then it goes to 900. This is doubles. Yeah. Then it goes to 1,000. So now me and Greg are starting to slowly tap. I think I, I get somewhere around that day, I get like 625 plate weight <laughs> and 550 pounds of band. But I was already squatting close to 1,100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg gets a little bit less than me just because of body weight. Yeah. And now we tap and it's just Vlad Chuck and, and Vlad and Vlad wants to beat Chuck just as bad as Chuck wants to beat Vlad and Vlad's just slowly working his way up. He's, he had not out squatted Chuck yet. He's a lot bigger than Chuck Huge. too, right? I mean, yeah. he's six, he's my height and weighs 360. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> you know, so he's a fucking goddamn, <laughs> you know, a Russian tank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> the weight goes up to close to 800 bar weight with 550 pounds of band tension. So we have 800 pounds of plate weight, <laughs> two blues and a green. And so I, I, anybody watching, I would ask you to just any way you can set up a single blue, oh my gosh. put it on a fucking squat bar and walk it out and then double that at a green and add 800. It's, I mean, it's, it's, you'll, I'll never see it again. No. Not, so not did you level. know when you were in that moment as a lifter, you like, oh, I I'm watching. Yeah. I knew I you. Knew. I knew you knew. That's I why knew I, and I wish, I wish that this technology oh, at yeah. that time would have been better because there was no video. Yeah. You know, and you were so, witnessing like a historic squat workout that no. Never so they seen. had done the 700 ish weight and boom, 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 boom. And Vlad's starting to really struggle. His body weight's better. So for band tension, him and Chuck kind of evened themselves out because Chuck was so explosive, yeah. but Chuck could get out of control real fast. Yeah, yeah. Vlad was bigger, but was unused to the tensions. So they go to the next one, and I'm like, Vlad, you sure you want to do that, man? You're already above what you can squat. There's no, yeah. You've already shocked your central nervous system into the fucking stratosphere. For sure. No, I have to beat Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, nobody beats Chuck. And he's, I was like, I'm thinking in my head, you're not going to beat him. Yeah. Because if He'll you, like if, ready to die. Because well, if you get this, he's just going to put another fucking plate on. So Chuck does it first because he wants to set precedence. Yeah. So Fucking it's like 800-something it. with 550 pounds of band tension. He sits on the box and boom, then sits again, boom. And it looks like he's flexing so hard that that that, that Mastodon squat bar is fucking hopping. <laughs> yeah. oh. Like it's 585 on a regular bench bar. And I'm like, oh, my fucking God. Yeah. Right? So he racks it, and he's all, fuck, rah, you know, fucking yeah. bleeding. And so <laughs> Vlad gets under there, and he picks it up and just fucking boom to just the box. Staples them. Staples them. And so we're all picking it up and we're all insanely strong. I, we can barely get it back in the fucking rack. And I'm like, he's like, give me five minutes. Want to try again. <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea. And I'm like, don't Fuck. fucking do that. I'm like, we got a pin pull, you know, because Chuck, when he'd get ready for me, he always wanted to feel like berserk weights, like right below the knee. Jeez. And I was never good at pin pulls. I was always better off the floor. And so no, Vlad's like, no, fuck you. Do it again. So we put it back up there. We had to take the weights off, put it back. He gets crushed again. And then he's like, he goes, give me another five minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, no, motherfucker, you're done. Yeah. Like, and then finally Louis steps in and goes, nah, you need to stop. Yeah. You know? And so he finally stops and he's pissed and Chuck knew he got him. Yeah. So then we go to the pin pulls and Vlad doesn't do that well at the pin pulls because the central nervous system is Wrecked. destroyed. Yeah. Chuck pulls like 1,010 from the knee. <laughs> Jeez. Right? This is what gets fucked up. We go to the meet about four to five weeks later. This was the last meet I did at Westside. Vlad fucking smokes 1250 in the squat. Chuck bombs out. Really? 
And that's when I started to realize that Chuck was leaving everything he had in the gym yeah. and wasn't learning to taper and put all the energy into the meat. Mm. And Vlad would push himself, but Vlad, the two weeks before the meet, was like, need time down, relax. Yeah. And Chuck was like, no, man, I'm going in to work out. You know? And what I started to realize is there was timing to all of that. And although Vlad didn't do it correctly as far as the loading parameter, yep. and Chuck was just to compete in the gym, yeah. that it, it fucked him up royally trying to beat a guy that probably if, if Chuck would have taken just the seven plates, which had been calculated to what he was going to try to squat, yeah. but he wanted to beat him in the gym. So yeah. this is where it gets complex and you have to be careful mm. is at the highest level, you have to balance competition with, again, nobody knows other than me and a handful of others and people listening now yeah. about that squat session. But everybody remembers Vlad squatting 1250 for the first yeah. time. My point is, is where are you putting your energy mm -hmm. and what is it transferring to? Sure. And that was really, I learned a lot from Chuck, but one thing I learned was how to back off to make sure the numbers got better. Yeah. yeah. And that again, at West side, you, sometimes you learn more of what not to, to do, do than what to do. Yeah. Cause there's that fine line. Like Ramos would tell me, he go, <laughs> you know, if I didn't like have strippers sleeping in my car on, on, for, on Sundays yeah. and would have drank some protein <laughs> shakes, <laughs> like he goes, maybe I'd have done better. And I go, yeah, but I said I would argue that part of it was because you were so not you were so like stress relieved. That's why he went and you know total two thousand and well, fucking eighty one or whatever. Like part of there's part of the crazy that works in the favor, mm -hmm. and part of the crazy that maybe doesn't allow it to be as long longevity wise. Absolutely, and you know I, I would say that Westside probably had the the biggest conglomeration of people that if they truly they had all the focus they needed in the gym, but their lifestyle yeah. wasn't conducive for them. No bullshit. Jerry Obradovich would have been this, one of the strongest guys to ever live from Westside Barbell or in the world period if he, if he wouldn't have been a drug addict at yeah, the time. exactly. He literally, and, and I'm not busting his ass because he's a great guy, he was on a two-week crack binge. Then they find him in a crack house. Louis personally goes and gets him out of a crack house, fucked up, cleans him up for three days. He goes and wins the Arnold Bench Bash for cash. What the He's fuck? that gifted. Like that yeah. badass. Yeah. Like you're That's a crackhead. You just came out of rehab. And he probably just benched 700 pounds. And he just walked out. I think it was like 744. It was their first bench press over over like 725 ever at Westside Barbell off of a crack bench. I mean. It's like you can't even make that up if you tried. No. <laughs> and that was just the first time I was slowly coming there. So yeah. I saw it all. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> what know? world are we living in? <laughs> but I'll tell you when I, when I knew where I was at and what was, what was really going to go down and what it was going to take to get my goals was I, I want to say it was the third or fourth time I went to train with Louie and Louie's like, yeah, I'll be in the gym with you guys. But you know, I just got done getting my knee scope. So I don't know what I'm going to do. Literally got this knee scope the day before we trained. <laughs> okay. Of course. So imagine you get fucking knee surgery and then Corey's like the next day, Let's come, box in, squat. come in box squat with us. You'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> Not Louie. Yeah. Louie walks in. He's got bandages all over his knee. And he's like, he's like, I don't know how good I feel, but I think I'll squat with you guys today. And I'm like, what? This dude just had a fucking knee surgery. He gets under there, and within the third set or so, blood is just pouring down his calf. Of course. From he's breaking the sutures. Yeah, of course. Or whatever the whatever the fuck they did. <laughs> and it's just bleeding down his calf. And I, I can't stop but sit there and look and go, where the fuck am I? Yeah, yeah. This is like I get about being hardcore. Yeah. This seems There's a little levels. extreme. Yeah. And that's when you, that's when I realized how fucking psychotic he yeah. really was, and the handful of the guys were there. So when I started, uh, <laughs> when I got to go pull with him one time, and it was like probably 2010. It was like when he was getting ready for his last meet, mm. where he went like 805, four and a half, like 675. He like totaled something ridiculous at like 63. Mm -hmm. And we went up. Me and this other guy named Jason went up for a deadlift session, and Louis got them old purple briefs on. Mm -hmm. He's pulling. He's bleeding all over those the fucking, fucking those be, by and by and for a little bit of a discussion, those purple briefs smell like Conan's riding blanket. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, bro. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm getting to that story now. Yeah. So he's pulling, he's bleeding all over the fucking bar. Everyone and I'm walking up to this bar and I'm like, I'm looking around like thinking, all right, I know I have to deadlift this, but there's a lot of blood on this fucking bar. And it, that kind of happens here now, but I didn't know any of these motherfuckers either. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so then he gets done pulling or whatever. He's bleeding out his nose, bleeding out. He's like, help me get these briefs off. Yeah. And me and Jason, we're pushing on, and Louis starts bleeding on Jason's arm. <laughs> and Jason's looking at me, uh -huh. and we're basically like half ass interns, like not even supposed to be there. He's looking at me like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Right well, I tell you, you know, I remember the first time seeing that shit because he was just bleeding down his knee on squats. But yeah. I remember we would deadlift and he would scrape 
you know, his yeah. shins or bleed on the bar from his nose. And then you'd go next. And then I'm thinking, I'd really like to get AIDS the cool way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know I swear I mean? to you, that's what I thought too. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> this is the way I want to go oh, down. That's our quote. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I'm like, I know the yeah. doctors aren't going to believe it. Oh, He's like, God. you got AIDS from a deadlift bar. Right. Uh, you know, all right, let me check your butt. I, yeah. I remember thinking like, <laughs> I'm going to, I remember thinking I'm about to catch something crazy up yeah. here. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. It was fun. All right, Danny, your oh, turn for a question. Yeah. Dude, I don't know how I, <laughs> how do you Follow that up. Um, I, that. <laughs> um, I just <laughs> God. Uh, going back to le- to uh, um, longevity is what I keep thinking about when you said you've basically been injury free, excluding your groin. So like, and you said like you've learned like what not to do by your experiences at Westside. How has that like kind of transferred over to with your athletes? Like, what are some of the some of the things that you like? are like staples in your training program. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, It's really, really kind of ties into what we were just saying. Mm -hmm. Um, One, there's no need to go over, unless you're a lifter, there's no need to go over 90%. Yeah. 90% is the breaking point where the body gets enough information to get better, but not so much information it overtrains. Yeah. That is step one. And what I learned is in max effort training, I do not fail. One, I don't want to teach my body to ever fail. And two, I can adjust it. Yeah. Because within reason, I could probably hit ninety percent any day. Yep. But that extra that extra ten to get to hundred is going to require super compensation. So if I push to one hundred percent all the time, basically you're at maximum tension that the that all the tissue can handle without going through super compensation. Right. I got you. Okay. Right. Yeah, without yeah. going through deloading. Yep. Uh, at to actually peak for a specific for a, lift, yep. which mm-hmm. you don't want to do very often in the year. Yep. I would say at most two times. Um, so that is one thing. The next thing is making sure that the accessory work and the mode of training exercise changes on a consistent basis so that the pressure gradients on each joint change weekly. Mm-hmm. So if I like to do, say, V-bar pushdowns, yep. well, I'll use that one day. Then 72 hours later, it's a rope. 72 hours later, it's my hands are backwards. 72 hours later, it's overhead. My point is, is that almost, I would say, 75% of the people that email me go, Matt, I really like your workouts and I like watching your Instagram shit, but those exercises you do, like say that tricep push down, they really affect my elbow. So I ask them, well, what other exercises you do? Well, I just do that one. Well, that's why your fucking elbows hurt you, dumbass. They're fucking weak. <laughs> so if you do the exact same thing, the exact same way all the time, you're creating specific mileage in that exact point. Yeah. But you can train that muscle in different angles, pressures, and resistances, yep. bands, chains, free weights, cables. They all have different levels of pressure, different what I would consider cams. Mm-hmm. You know, where the pressure is on a cable is even throughout the entire motion. Weights, due to acceleration, change. They're lighter at the top than they are at the bottom. The point is, is if you're changing those pressure gradients on the joints on a consistent basis, the body never really gets to overtrain at the joint. And that's why I truly believe my back, my knees, and my shoulders are still insanely healthy. Yes. Is because I move the movements around where they're specific enough to see transfer, but in specific enough to reduce mileage. Fucking <laughs> bang. That was a banger. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. Trayvon, what you got, yeah, buddy? A banger. <laughs> um, I'm like more curious on like how like speed, I guess, directly transfers, or transfers over to like lifting because like, for example, like Corey said, I ran track in college. And so like, I feel like because of explosiveness and everything, like I've always been like, I've been just like good at like deadlifting or squatting Mm -hmm. and stuff like that because I've been fast like with the barbell itself and stuff like that. So and Mm -hmm. and he read the West Side uh, book in high school and did tons of hamstring work. Yeah, so like yeah, like in high school, like four smarter than yeah, four tracks. He was doing like uh, (laughs) two hundred band leg, you know, like every day in high school, like two (laughs) hundred. Band, like, like so you took it literally what he said. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember the first time going this. I don't know how much of this to believe because when I was first coming over there to Louie's place, uh, Louie would write all the time about reverse hypers, reverse hypers. Yeah. Putting two and two together, he was selling them, which I get. Yeah. And he's like, you know, Mike Ruggiero just squatted 1,050 and he uses reverse hypers all the time, blah, blah, blah. And I finally get there and I get to be kind of friends with the guys. And I go, hey, Ruggiero, what's your volume on the week? You know, for because I want to get bigger like you what do i need to do to get that shit and he goes he goes man don't tell louie but i don't ever do reverse hypers and i'm like what and he goes he goes yeah whatever he was writing about that because i don't read them he's i'm not doing those i go why he goes my stomach's too big he goes when i lay on the machine i feel like i'm gonna fucking puke yep and he was literally the biggest midsection i mean it wasn't fat either no he was just so big and uh, that's when i started to realize i'm like i gotta be careful with what i'm reading and actually 
utilizing it verbatim. He's exactly right that the hamstrings are a weakness, but doing 200 of something every day, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. a little extreme, right? Yep. So um, I, I want to tell you a Rogerio story. So yeah, I had seen some of the old West Side videos, so I knew who he was. And I lived in Pataskala, close to the gym before. Yeah, he lives out here this way somewhere. Yeah, so one day I'm, I'm in my, I lived in this little log cabin, and I'm, I look out the window, and I see this big motherfucker sitting across the street just sweating. <laughs> like just sitting on a That's bucket. Him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just sitting on a bucket sweating. And I'm looking, and I'm like, man, I know that guy. Looks, and he lo he's like 360. Yeah. He's fucking huge. And I started looking, I'm like, that's that fucking guy from the fucking Speed Squad video. Yeah. So I walk over, it was his uh, wife's parents lived beside me, and mm -hmm. I didn't know it. Yeah. So then that was like, so I got over, I'm, I'm talking squats, I'm like talking to Mike Rosario, just randomly was like literally <laughs> yeah. next door to my house one day, and he was the nicest guy. Oh, awesome. He wasn't there uh, anymore at that point, but he even just in a 15-minute conversation, I learned like eight things. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, he's a good But dude. yeah, there's no way he could probably be on hyper. No, he was he's way built. too big, and... You know, he was probably even bigger than that when you saw him because yeah. his heyday was, I would say, between like 98 and 04. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I, that's when I started to realize, like, okay, I'm going to read these books and I'm going to get a lot of information from them. But you got to see what the guys actually do verbatim. A, a lot of things that we we were doing were, wasn't necessarily written perf perfectly. Yeah. You know, and, I never heard a guy like when I would go on Fridays because, you know, I was squatting with Tim Harold, Joe Bayless, um, mm -hmm. those guys on, on Fridays. And, and I would be like, what percentage are we using for our dynamic work? And and that's when I was like, they were like looking at me like, <laughs> yeah, it was just fucking and gritters screaming. And they're, I mean, they had lost all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my point. Of what, what percentages even meant. Which is where I think <laughs> Matt, whenever, well, first off, none of our guys were, you know, powerlifting equipment except for me from time to time. Sure. I had hurt, back to your point, like I squatted 700 for the first time. That I knew I had more in me. So the next week I tried to squat 740 and I ripped my labrum. There you go. That was my first injury. So if I'd have been obviously deloading like a smart guy, which I didn't know at that time, this well, is yeah. fucking 15 years ago, whatever. Sure. But it's like that was injury one. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, before well, here's, that. Here's what's crazy is that labrum was probably already pissed. Yes. You just you just put the fucking last little accent. I know I got 40 more in but me, which is more of that Chuck approach. Here's what, Yeah, here's what you learn is, is that if you'd have gave it six or eight weeks to recuperate, yep. because soft tissue heals slower than muscle due to its non-vascular, you know, makeup, you would have fucking probably smoked 770. Exactly. So again, what the problem is, it's just like everybody falls into that trap. Hey, I just been 315. It was really easy. Let's try 325 next week. Your nervous system and your muscles yep. are still damaged. Yep. So not only are you in a hole, now you're ready You're ready to get fucked up, which is another reason why you should always rotate your movements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was a great lesson, but you know it's, what came out of it was, you know, and every time, and I've only been hurt a couple times, but it's like I start to learn, like, all right, well, how am I going to keep this joint together now? Mm -hmm. And that's where the lunges came from. Yep. And so my GPP, I was like, all right, I've got to figure out, one, how as I'm lighter, I can stay, I can stay stronger because I would go and do these photo shoots and I'd be super fucking weak because sure. I would look good, but I wasn't strong, but I really wanted to compete. So it was like, I can't, I, I remember seeing Ronnie Coleman do like some shit. He wasn't even touch his knee or anything, but I was like, all right, he did some lunges. Like I'll just go to the track and go around one time. And I went around the one time and I was like, my leg pump was fucking crazy. My hip felt good. I couldn't walk for like 10 fucking days because sure. I, I wasn't even prepared for that. And then I started going back and doing it more often. And then it became like, as I was reading Louis stuff, I'm like, I wonder if this is like my sled work mm -hmm. because I need this. And then what also was crazy is Matt, my metabolic rate went mm -hmm. and my hormones for being older felt like they were high. Like everything was pinging. I was like, I'm leaner. So I'm stronger and my body's staying yeah, together. So what that's telling you is that your weakness at that particular time yeah. was general physical capacity. Correct. But in reality, if, the only problem I would say with the with the lunges is mm. they worked well for you because your body weight was light. Yeah, yeah. If you were a bigger guy It'd going for that, it, one it would be tough, but two it'd be hard on your joints. Yeah, and you were already athletic before you were strong. So the older guys are scaling them like Anthony Oliveira and uh, Joe Bayless. They do like a hundred. Yeah. So they'll do sled and they say a hundred. And so it's like, to their point, they're like, we're not about to do 400, 800 meters. Sure. It's too fucking much. We weigh 250 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what I'm seeing is some of the bigger guys are like, 
you know, Louis talked about not training quads all the time. Yep. These guys are both built where they have big quads and it's like, but they've neglected them a little bit. And with the lunge work, their hips and their quads have blown up a bit and they become so, more equal. You got it. And Anthony's a man. If I put my briefs on, they're fucking tight now. They feel well, good. So it's I been interesting say, to see that. Yeah, little I would scale. say that the guys at West side, like you're talking about Bayless and those dudes are going to be the only guys you ever see that their posterior chain is going to out, out maneuver their anterior chain. Yeah. It's never that way. So then if they bring it back and yeah, and match it now the strength goes through the roof yeah which is what they both kind of are saying yeah which is interesting so i mean you have some good points there but i think the big thing you hit on and you started to realize which is what i realized with winning warm-ups mm. is that work capacity becomes a limiting factor to yes all of your gains because it's the limiting factor to your recuperation yeah. Now you can do that with lunges or my warm ups yep. or whatever, but eventually how fit you are is how strong you can get. It's a great segue to just overall like volume in general. That mm -hmm. people, you know, you talk about winning warm ups doing three, four, five sets of twenty five before you bench press at certain weights, pushing them up, different angles. And like I've always been we do our conjugate max, we do whatever, then we do basically accessory, which is just bodybuilding shit. Sure. Because I'm a mix of, you know, conjugate stuff, 70s bodybuilding, that's where I, kind of what I learned. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people were always tripping on like all the volume that we do and all the work capacity. And I'm like, but there's a reason why we've continued to look this way because the whole group's fucking yoked. The numbers continue to go up. There isn't a lot of injuries in our group too. I've actually kind of taken the brunt of a lot of that shit because I learned a lot, mm -hmm. just like Lou did. And it's like, I just don't know why. Is it because it's difficult? Because it's hard? Like, why is everybody so fucking scared of actually doing volume? And they think that you got to take all this stuff or use all these drugs to just recover from this when I've never taken anything my whole life and I've done tons of fucking volume. And I know yeah. some of it's genetic, I get, but my work capacity has always been pretty high. Well, here's the thing is it's hard because <clears throat> what you have to realize is that most people if you look at the old Bulgarian Soviet Eastern Bloc texts, they don't develop the work base before they build the strength. Okay. And so what ends up happening is now their whole mindset is in the strength range. Yeah. And now they have to play catch up I again, gotcha. conjugate mindset. Where's my weakness? So if you're attacking things where guys are, can't breathe and they feel like shit and initially not all, not, not until you work through it. Initially, it probably makes you weaker. Yeah. yeah. They're not willing to take, the deficit I and they're you. not willing to take the ego punch in the dick. Yeah. Once that happens and then they don't care anymore, then everything starts to shine. But there is that refractory period. Yeah. That adaption that phase that where most people get... will not, will not stick with. I, I seen probably at least 200 firemen I put through winning warmups. And at first they just bitch at me. This is too much. I'm too tired. Yeah. Now I can't do my main lifts, blah, 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 blah. I said, shut the fuck up and just do it. Yeah. They do it for six months and then we retest and their max goes up 15% without testing the actual lift yeah and then they're sold they understand all the supporting shits there but the only reason i've learned to experiment with them is because they don't necessarily have as much of a choice yeah when i'm there they got to do what i tell them yeah yeah that's but your you, job but when you're writing <laughs> yeah. an article yeah where you're giving somebody this information they don't know how to digest they just it just think i'm fucking nuts yeah <laughs> which yeah. partly true but yeah <laughs> it was a mixture of i mean the winning warm-ups came from uh, 2012, I do my first raw contest. I benched 600, mm -hmm. but I didn't squat first. And okay. then, so as I benched this 600, which I felt was the limiting factor to where is Dan Kovacs' total, the all-time world record raw achievable. Okay. I knew if I could bench 600 raw, which I knew I was close anyway, but have to actually do it, then I knew the squat and the deadlift because the deadlift with gear doesn't help. Yeah, no, it's completely. Right, yeah. Maybe a little bit in, in I've keeping, pulled the same numbers both ways. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. I would say that only the only thing gear does really is keep you from getting beat up from it. Yeah. I will tell you that when I train with powerlifting equipment, I'm not near as banged up. No. Because it stores more kinetic energy, keeps you, it forces you to stay in good position. Yeah. You know, if you've got a good set of briefs or a suit on, you can't reach over and grab the bar incorrectly. That's true. It just won't let you. Yeah, yeah, So really why it keeps you from getting beat up is it forces technical proficiency. Yeah, that's true. Same in right? squat too. Yeah. So with that being said, I, I benched 600 and now I'm looking at the all-time total record, which is 2202. Keep in mind, I'm the only guy to go from equipped to raw and break world records in both. Yeah, that's not common. Right, no, it's no. impossible, oh, yeah. nearly, because they're two different sports. They it's are like who's won sports. Formula One and NASCar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, they're yeah, still yeah. driving mm -hmm. fucking cars, but they're not the same. No, I agree. I, that's why I've always explained when, like, basically, like, a gen pop person is like, I don't understand the suits. I'm like, this is, like, an extreme version of it. That That's basically the best way to explain it. Like, yeah. that, you know, and somebody like, well, it's easy because you put a suit on. I'm like, 
are you on rack 700 pounds? Mm -hmm. Still got to hold it. <laughs> you still got to fucking squat. I it. said, you know what people ask me all the time when I did the 1197.6 yeah. world record, I was like, was in gear. I was like, we can put that on the bar and you can pick, you can just get it up out of the rack anytime you want. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you what, it ain't happening. Yeah. Cause I picked that up and I felt my femurs bow and I still blocked it out and squatted. I mean, literally I remember Ed Cohen's there. Yeah. I mean, it's in Chicago and I'm and I've got my suit on and I'm a fucking bloated like 316. So good. Just weighed in at 308. Um, and it took me forever to weigh that, you know, yeah. and I even in a bad way. But that was just more bloated than I was fat. Yeah. I was just thick. And um, so Eddie's wrapping my knee and I got to tell him to back the knee wrap off because he's got it so fucking tight that I I can't I can't feel my feet. And I'm like, that's a shitty feeling for the 20 too. or 50 pounds that that knee wrap is going to help. I'd rather feel my feet underneath me for 1200. Yeah. Because balance is more important oh. than having the spring yeah. with those kind of weights. Cause you're talking, you know, four and a half, five times body weight. I mean, whatever the fuck it is, is insane. <laughs> and I remember, I remember crawling under the bar and I'm trying not to look at it because you know, oh, with 1200, yeah. you're got, you got 150 kilo plates and then 45s. <laughs> and it's like this much weight on each side of the bar and on a Mastodon, oh, yeah. it's it's bent. And you're just like, <laughs> holy fuck, right? Like, <laughs> it's a mind up. fuck at That's that point. Yeah. <laughs> so I get underneath there and I pick it up. And as soon as I pick it up, I felt my femurs go. Mm. Like, it wasn't a muscle feel. No. It was something I had never felt before. I picked it up and I could feel my femurs <laughs> flex. And that's when I did that squat and racked it. And I don't remember doing the squat. <laughs> the blood pressure was so high oh. when I picked it up out of the rack. I cracked a bunch of blood vessels in my eyes just picking it up and then i was bleeding out of both nostrils out of the rack just to Jeez, lift it out of the, the rack pressure. and after that point I realized, ah. I realized i didn't have the ball sack to do that yeah, yeah. well what else you got to prove after nothing that. at that point other than just die yeah so, <laughs> you know, so 2012 that was 11 so 2012 i benched 600 with george yeah and uh, me and george and uh i can't remember who else was training with us at the time we go to just a local meet. It was over close to where Westside was. It was like at a Y, and I benched 600. And uh, I sit down with George, and I'm like, I can take Kovacs' record for sure. So 2013, I do my first USPA walked-out meet, no knee sleeves, belt only. Okay. I didn't want anybody to say fucking shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the you know whole, they're coming right at you. Well, you know the whole asterisk of that was, well, conjugate only works for equipped lifters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. So the first time I go to a raw meet, yeah. I hit the third highest total of all time, my first raw meet. <laughs> Fuck right? off, everybody. And I'm, and I'm within 70 pounds of the world record. In wow. three, so I only need 70 more pounds and three lifts. So I squat like 788 because when I get there, I don't realize the USPA is a walkout meet. Yeah, yeah that's So now I got to walk it out. But I came from the IPF, so it wasn't that bad. Okay. So I walk out like 788, dunk it. I just posted a picture on my Instagram yeah, of it. Yeah, I saw that ass deep shin straight as fuck yeah, yeah, yeah. fucking raw right oh that yeah. that technique doesn't work raw yeah, yeah, okay. yeah of course so so <laughs> i do i do that but what i noticed was i got to the bench right and i felt my training i had benched 565 for a triple in training so i'm like i got 611 easy <laughs> uh -huh. just thinking about it well after the squat my ass is fucking handed to me i'm tired so i go to the squat i go to the bench press i smack like five and a quarter as a warm-up then go to like 572 and the 572's got like this little like hiccup. Like I get it, but it's heavy at the top. Yeah. Something's off. So I try like 606 instead of 611, and it fucking tanks me. And I'm thinking, what the fuck, right? So I pull like 750. I hit the seventh highest total or third highest total of all time. And I'm driving home, and I'm like, the first initial thought process is you're not strong enough. You just need to get stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I start thinking like, I'm not fucking like that squat kick my ass. Yeah. And now my shape. deadlift's down 20, 30. And my, because it's raw yep. and then my bench is down 30, 40 pounds. So I'm thinking, well, fuck, if I can just figure out how to get those numbers to be not deficient after a heavy squat. Yeah. Cause remember the world record in the squat was only 822. Right. So I'm already at 788 meet one. Yeah. 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 And so I, I go back home with this idea. I had just gotten back home from speaking in Australia and there was this PhD student talking about pre fatigue and performance enhancement. And they were doing all of these exercises, strength exercises, before rugby practices, and they were noticing higher EMG results, huh. i.e. the nervous system yeah, was becoming yeah. primed. We call it, we call it potentiation now. Yep. And so as I'm driving home, I'm like, man, what about that potentiation shit? So I call up my friend Flex Wheeler. And I'm like, hey, Flex, if you were going to try to do stuff to just put on a little bit more muscle mass and get a little bit more condition, what would your rep range be? 
And he goes, dude, I never got in better shape than doing twenties. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, 20, 25 reps. There's the, there's the rep range. And now I'm starting to think GPP. Okay. How long should I need to train to get in better shape? I'm thinking, well, if I could do something that makes me a little tired, but not too fucked up, very similar to squatting a monster weight. Yeah. Maybe I should do something like four sets of 25. Cause I'm guessing with no breaks, that'd be about 12 to 14 minutes. Yep. Which if you look at GPP standards, that's okay. pretty close. So I started digging into my Russian books and saw Alexiev would swing a kettlebell for 15 minutes before he Olympic lifted. There you go. And now I'm like, now I have the time range, the rep range, and I know how to fill that time parameter up with a certain amount of reps. So I just go after it, but I control the variables. I only do it on the bench press. So I'm using like 35 pound dumbbells. I'm a 600 pound pincher. Yeah. 35 pound dumbbells for four sets of 25, lap pull downs and triceps. And I'm mixing and matching, but that's what I do. Sure. Eight months later, just experimenting with it on the bench. I go to Raw Unity in 14 when I was on the front cover of yeah. Mark Power. Bell's magazine. Oh, yeah, 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 yep. Power. And I, I break the all-time world record in the squat with 832, thinking, okay, do I have this fatigue shit figured out? 606 was like, bow! I should have done 633 that day. I killed Milanichev, all of them, in the bench. Fucking smoked them. And I'm just thinking, motherfucker, right? This whole time. <laughs> a three-piece work capacity thing. It was a conditioning factor. Yep. So wow. now, now I have one of the highest subtotals in human history yeah. with 832 and 606. Raw. <laughs> like no wraps, nothing. Yeah. Um, and that was the meat I pulled my groin. So I was oh, just in it. lined up to, de- to have the all-time world record. I had to pull 722. Mm-hmm. My best at that time was 822. I had to pull 722 on the deadlift. I go up to my third attempt to pull it. I lock in. I'm in Florida. I, I mean, I'm not really realizing I'm dehydrated. Yep. I go to yank on it and bang. Felt it pull right off the side of my pelvis. And I can't sit down. I can't really move. And I'm like, motherfucker, right? And the next day, I'm black to my ankle from it tearing up here. Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, anyway, I, I rehab it, end up breaking the world record but in the next year. But the point is, is that I had figured out that work capacity was the problem. Yeah. So I apply it with the squat. The next year, I squat 870 in a belt only. What was the, uh, if it was... First off, it's ridiculous. If it was, if it, hey, let me just say, if it was press, lat, tricep, what was the squat kind of? There's a squat. So I had just started yeah. to develop the first, the first models of the belt squat. Oh, okay. So now I'm doing four sets of 25 on belt squat because my theory is, is I don't need the back mileage. Yeah. I need the leg mass and I need the leg drive. Yep. But I don't want the spinal compression. Like that. So the belt squat becomes the primary factor. Then leg curls, yep. hamstrings at different ranges. Mm-hmm. So I would do bands from the top, bands from the side, yep. and then machines of any type I could find. Um, and then it was usually a bracing movement, a plank, a winning plank, a, okay. a band crunch, yep. a leg raise, something that was going to force my midsection to really brace it. Yep. Because the first thing I noticed when I went from equipped to raw was the fact that my bracing capacity was less because I didn't have that suit around me. Yeah, no, I noticed that. And at that same time, as you noticed, I was getting leaner. Yep. So I was starting to go talk to Serrano and Serrano's like, look, the waist know, getting smaller. I know you want to get stronger and I know that's your goal, but we got to keep balancing this blood work. And by that time, my triglycerides genetically were starting to get a little out of control mm-hmm. and my blood sugar was creeping up just a tick. I was like 101. It Got wasn't it. insanely yeah, high, yeah, yeah. but it was going the wrong direction. He's like, you fix it now. We'll never be on meds. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I just got to do what I get to do. So started eating cleaner. He started replacing a lot of my carbs with rice yep. instead of gluten. Mm-hmm. Um, he, we found out I had a dairy allergy. What was I doing to gain weight? I was drinking a gallon of chocolate milk a yeah, day. Of course. <laughs> I think everyone has a dairy allergy, yeah. to be honest, right? Matt. Oh, yeah. more, but yeah. my point is, yeah. is like what it was doing to me was it's causing so much inflammation. Oh, yeah. But I think, well, I just got to do this. I'm gaining weight. Yeah. I'm yeah. gaining fucking puffiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not getting any bigger. Yeah. Right. And so I'm not getting any stronger. Well, when you're that inflamed, it all obviously hinders your lifting, too. Because the whole far. fucking joint. You can't, well, then, and then you can't fucking recover. Yes. Because your body's just a fucking hot water balloon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so. That's um, a great way to explain So it. I start leaning out, and by 2016, now I got decent abs. And like I got veins and I'm 280, <laughs> so I was used to weighing like 310. Now I'm 280. No, you know maybe yeah. 16 percent, 17 percent. So I'm like at perfect level, right? And uh, so I noticed that my core, because my waist went from 
when I was bigger, 42 down to 36. Big difference. That I had to figure out a way to make those muscles work harder because I didn't have the center mass. Yeah. So people look at these Olympic lifters like Alexei and go, well, that dude's just a big fat guy. No, he's not. Yeah. That dude is building that center corset to withstand 500-pound oh, yeah. snatches. And you have to be bid in the midsection to be able to do that. Yeah, that's why, you know, it's amazing. Like when I teach like a brand new lifter just how to force into their belt mm -hmm. just to create that, the low, like they go up 30 pounds. Just like, wait a second, that felt way different. Once, once people even, some, I even had, there was a, a pro baseball guy that got onto some of my program stuff and he had never even braced into a belt like on a front squat mm -hmm. properly. And then he was like, what happens if I brace off the mound like that? Mm -hmm. it, it upped him like a few mile an hour just because he learned how to brace his core pushing off the fucking mound. It's all about proprioception. Your body learns how to press against something. Yeah. And then I personally believe you take the belt off and now you know how to do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The belt kind of is that external factor that teaches you what to do. True. Um, so I believe that training beltless is amazing. Yep. But if you learn to train with the belt sporadically, it helps your beltless training. Yeah, for sure. By far because of you know, your pro proprioception of those muscles. Well, and I just, so I just came off the of doing the powerlifting meet and equipment. And then I was like, I want to get back raw again and everything's starting to feel better. And so, yeah, it's funny. Like we just took that squat on Wednesday against 460 pounds of bands. So I take the, we had the bow bar, right. And I take a plate and I did, I put a belt on for that set. I come out of the hole and it looks like the thing fucking stops, right? Mm -hmm. It stops. And then I fucking, I, I just keep grinding because I'm used to being in, and I get through it. So I don't even take a quarter. I just jump a plate because I'm going to knee wrap on the next set. Yeah. So I know as soon as my body feels that little bit of tension, it's like it's like I got a suit on again. The, mm -hmm. my, my one against two plates is way fucking faster than that. But it's like once I add that brace, once I add a little bit, it's amazing how the body will like almost let off the, the, mm -hmm. the governor or whatever you were talking before. Yep. And I'm noticing though, but the biggest key was I had to train my lower abs heavy again because I couldn't feel, yep. it just didn't feel near the same. And that's the biggest thing is again, conjugate, if you're doing the right exercises for you at the right time, it's teaching that, let's just say like, it's teaching the belt. Yeah. You know, you do a good morning, it's teaching you how to lock in your lower back with your glutes and your hamstrings. Yeah. If you're using a belt, it's teaching you how to fire the TVA and create that stabilization and stiffness. Mm. You know, if you're using wrist wraps, it's telling you to keep your forearm tight. Yeah. So there are some advantages to putting that stuff on. I mean, when I squatted the 870 world record, I put my knee sleeves on myself. But just that little bit taught me to sit back a little farther and push out yep. because I had this, like, awareness right here. But that fucking, that shit was probably helping 20 pounds if you're yeah, lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get my point? But it's almost like the kinetic tape thing. It's like once the body just feels that little bit, it'll yeah. fucking, or at least that's what they say. I don't know yeah. I, I, don't <laughs> know. I don't know if that works or not. I don't ever use it. Yeah. Most people I see with kinetic tape on, I'm like, yeah, I don't think you need But that. I think that that's kind of the whole thought <laughs> process around it, right? Once they, once you feel like a yeah. little bit, because I, Bayless, I talked to him about it. He had some briefs that fucking looks like he had him since 1980. I'm like, dude, those things look like biker shorts. Like, I don't think they're, he's like, just that little bit of tension though. It makes everything just feel like a little bit. So it's like, mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. Um, I want to talk about, I know that you and uh, Louie hadn't had like a, a lot of interaction maybe the last few years before he passes away, but just talk about like, as he passes away, not only is it the body of work unbelievable, right? And you learn so much and then have taken it you know, further with what you understand from the books and the knowledge that you put in the gym. But it's like, what's it kind of overall mean for the sport? Kind of you personally, like, I don't know, just yeah. give, get some, kind of some feedback. I, I talked about this on Bell's podcast yeah. a couple weeks ago and, and he asked me and was confused at first and then understood. And I think that with not only the passing of Louie, but the passing of Verkashansky, yeah. the passing of Mevdiev, the guys we talked about that were yeah. the creators, not only of conjugate, but really understanding training in general. For sure. You know, um, the passing of Dr. Fred Hatfield. Yep. I f truly feel that 20 years ago, we were in a smarter place to work out. I heard this clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason is because the guys that really understood, I mean, think about it. Verkashansky had multiple PhDs. Zatsiorski which is semi-retired right now. He's got to be close to 100 years old. He was the, the head of the Central Institute of Physical Culture in Moscow. He saw everything. Went to Bulgaria, studied those guys, helped the East Germans when they won all their records. Jeez. My point is, is that nobody, there's no money and there's no, there's no prize in anaerobic sports right now. Yep. Where they're getting rid of Olympic lifting and Olympics. 
Yeah, I hope that doesn't stick. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. My guess to me, guesstimate is it will because the only countries that are good at it are the ones that have long-term preparation coaches, China and Iran. Yeah. They, you have to almost be in a conjugate system in a, um, or not a conjugate system, a communist system yeah. in order for long-term preparation to actually happen. For some reason, we've adapted that with gymnastics and hockey. Yep. But we've never adapted it with anything else. It's if you're good, you're good. And if you're not, well, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Louis took dudes that were shit bags that were going to jail and made them world record holders. That's the one thing that always drew me is like, we can build our lifters. I can take a guy out of the bar mm -hmm. and I can make him elite. Mm -hmm. And that fucking, because I knew I wasn't elite walking around. Well, and that's what's amazing about powerlifting is that it, you may not be the most genetically gifted out of the, out of the gate. But if you train smart and you know what you're doing, yep. and you're focused, and you have a long-term mentality, you can be very, very good. Yeah. You may not be the best ever, but you're going to be good. The guys that are best ever are going to be guys built like Hack and Eddie Cohen. Yep. You know, it's just, it's just only every once in a while. But the point is, what I love about power thing is if somebody really wants to put the drive, energy, work, and education in, yeah. they can be really good. Facts. And that's, and that's enticing. That always was to me because I'm like, just like anything else in my life, I just stay at it long enough. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna figure things out. I learn things today. I'm gonna learn things. That's why, like, uh, I never was uh, thought any close that I thought I knew everything. I'm like every all these old guys. I would bring in like if we couldn't figure out something in our group. Like Tony, come in and watch these guys. Mm -hmm. Anthony, come in and watch these guys. When Luke Luke came by, I'll come back and watch. It. Like, I was never. I was always open minded. They're gonna grab some because they've seen guys like Chuck, you, like. To me, it yeah. never it never made sense not to invite that in. You yeah. know what I mean? I so I think with that being lost, I think we're taking a step backwards. And I think the other thing that's made it go backwards is social media. I agree. With Everybody that. Everybody wants that immediate. Yeah. You know, well, it's not about it's not about the complexity of the education of the program. Yep. I want it now. Yeah. And we all know that strength at a high level doesn't come now. And anybody trying to sell you that, you need to fucking run. Yeah. Because all he's going to set you up for is a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that's the biggest problem. And so with those pioneers, you know, I'm trying to step up. I, you know, hopefully this book is is allotting me a PhD. That's so cool. So that'll be cool. I'm trying to do the best I can to be the next Hatfield the next Louis with a higher education. Your content's been amazing, Matt, that the, you've been putting out. The content I'm really trying with the YouTube videos to give yep. people as much as I can without throwing my business under the radar. Sure, of course. But the point is, is like, I don't see a lot of guys really doing that. They're either in fitness because they want to be famous yeah. or make money, yep. which I, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But you still have to have a core value that makes you underneath that shell very, very non-expendable. Yeah, yeah. And the problem is if you really dig deep on, I'd say... 80% of the fitness guys that yeah. are famous right now, Maybe they have nothing to offer you. <laughs> They're genetic freaks yep. that have done super simplistic things and think that simplistic things are going to work for you. And in reality, that's just not the case. And so, you know, I remember clean as day. One of the best things that, and I said this on Bill's podcast, I squat 700 at 20 years old. Okay. So that puts me at one of the top guys in the juniors in the country. Yeah. And Eddie comes up to me cause it's close to Chicago than me cause I'm from Indiana. And he goes, man, that was an amazing squat. He goes, if you can hold on for another six or eight years, you're going to be way over 800. Wait a minute. You just said six or eight fucking years. Yeah. Not next meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not, what everybody wants. Not, not in three months. Yeah. But my point was, is what made me great was that I didn't give a two fucking shits on how long it was going to take to do yeah. it. I like to train. I like to know the process. Yeah. The goal, the end goal was not in my radar. Sure. That was just um, a byproduct of being good. What I always try to explain too is that what you walk through and some of the history things that I told you about the gym, if that's not the backdrop, none of this other stuff happens anyway, Matt. No. It, it the businesses don't grow, the online stuff doesn't work. Like it's because it really, it, I really care about it to that level. I, yeah. I fucking love it. So if Corey hits the lottery tomorrow, I'm still training the next day. Mm -hmm. I'm still like, and when guys come in and out of the crew, Oh, I can't make it on this day or that. I'm going to be here tomorrow. Like, it's just what I do. Mm -hmm. And I do want to get better and I want to get stronger. And I still think I'm on the front side of things I can accomplish sure. later in my career. And it's like when people start to realize, and I'm not selling them some fast shit. Mm -hmm. That's the thing is somebody comes into my program. They're like, you want me to lunge? What? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like the things that, um, well, but that, when people really dive in though, they're getting really quality results though. And long, and there's sure. long term. But the problem is, is that the long term people, you know, and you'd almost rather have them 
anyway. Yeah. But you look at all these guys. That's why you and I have a couple of hundred yes. thousand followers and not a, not couple, a couple million. Not a million. I know. That shit bugs me, but it is the truth, though. Oh, I get 100%. frustrated as fuck over it all, yeah. all the time. Yeah. But, again, you know, you get the people that you should have anyway. Agreed. Because you could have three million, but if they're all shitheads. It doesn't matter. And they're not, they're not going to help you with anything. And they're no. not. They're just there for free shit. Then what yeah. do you want them for anyway? No, I agree with that. And so my thing is, is I think, you know, I just got really lucky that I was in a a schooling scenario where the best in the world were my teachers. Yeah. They were all the innovators of the NSCA. At Ball State. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Kramer, yeah. He, oh, was, yeah. he was the founder of the NSCA. Yep. Dr. Pearson was the founder of the NSCA. I forgot Kramer was there when you were there. Yeah. Jeez. Dr. Dr. Uh, Volick, mm-hmm. big nutrition guy, was there at the time. Probably the top nutritionist in the country. My point is, is that I just got really lucky. Now, a lot of people don't know this background, but the reason that all those guys were at my home school was because we had contracts with NASA. Oh, so shit. NASA astronauts, whether you know it or not, after about 10 to 12 days in space, lose 50% of their strength because they're not in a gravitational field. Yeah, they're, they atrophy real fast. They atrophy right? like that because this much and that much is the same amount of power in space. It doesn't matter. Yep. There is no gravity. So the muscles just, it's like being bedridden and not being able to move for two weeks. Wow. Jeez. So we're trying to study how do we get them to exercise in small compartments. So Dr. Newton, Dr. Kramer, and all them were tasked with that with unlimited budget. Wow. So I like that answer, unlimited budget. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're dealing with NASA and astronauts. I yeah. mean, it's not going to be like, yeah, you're, yeah. you know, you're getting a budget from the high school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? so, high school boosters. But, yeah. As you know, around that time, they stopped flying a lot of astronauts, and then the, the funding dissipated, and then Kramer left and went to UConn. Yep. And they all dissipated. But at that time, I got really lucky, and that's why if you go on YouTube and type in Matt Winning NSCA, I've spoke there six or eight times. Why? Yeah. Because all my professors started that fucking shit. So it was an automatic shoe in for that. But again, being at Ball State at the time I was at, being at Westside at the time I was at, and then being smart enough to really pick up what to use and what to throw away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have this perfect storm that probably nobody's going to be able to ever see again. I mean, in my opinion, because most people that are going to school right now for kinesiology or exercise science, what did their professors ever do? Yeah, no, it's Jack true. shit. Yeah. I mean, Kramer, Kramer got, I remember searching out Kramer when I was an MP for, yeah. for studies. I, I know he's well, a and Kramer, fucking Well, and Kramer's the most public. He's Ohio State. Yeah. He's there now, yeah. Well, he's, he just or, retired. Yeah. He retired, I think, last year. But the point is, is that he, um, he's he been the most publicated. No question. Researched, researcher in the fucking ever. He's in, I, I don't even want to know the number, but it's like 600 fucking papers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's un- something it's insane. Unbelievable. You look up strength training. He's like the M- MJ, that shit, bro. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. So long story short is being with those particular people at that particular time gave me a, a very good base mm-hmm. to grow from if I was willing to learn. Yeah. It's, you know, and I always kind of think about uh, my opportunities the same way is that when I was able to hang around West side enough to get a clue, because it made me a way different trainer, obviously, and understand and then being able to specifically ask Arnold about a bunch of the shit they sure. did. And that's why my kind of claim is I'm the only guy that really has got to learn from them each individually, sure. personally. And that was, uh, and, and also just understanding how they operate. See, I think mm-hmm. that's the thing is like learning from a book or a video is way different than learning in person, right? Absolutely. The things you, the first fucking time you walk into West Side, you realize there's a lot of different shit going on than what you was reading, right? Mm-hmm. And then on top of it, those intangibles. And it was the same with the way, not only the stuff I picked up from Arnold when it comes to actual training, but just the way he moved. The focus. The focus, the fucking, yeah. the confidence, the fucking belief. It was like, yep. I'm like, well, this is all part of it, right? And same with uh, Louis. He believed that he could make anybody strong, right? And that's where people get confused, I think, with Arnold, with Louis, with you and me at some point, is they look at us as our confidence is an ego thing. I have no fucking ego. No. But I'm confident enough Build to know that time. I can do whatever the fuck I want to do. Facts. And you don't. And that's why you are threatened by... It's earned, bro. Exactly. And, and I've told that people It's funny time. because um, I actually got to train with Arnold mm-hmm. probably four or five years ago. I didn't get to have him the same conversations as you, but... Yeah. O'Hearn introduced me to yeah, Arnold. Awesome. And then Arnold was like, another fucking OG. <laughs> he's like, I'm training some arms today. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, can I come with you, man? And this is with a funny story. Yeah. <laughs> and it's quick. So he, he's standing around these fucking five jackasses. I have no idea who they are. Yep. They just look like they don't even work out. They're just hanging out with Arnold. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is this, right? <laughs> like, I would think an entourage of like former Olympians. Yeah, You're thinking yeah. he's hanging out with Dorian and like, no. you know, I mean, because you don't know. 
Yeah. And this was like 2016. And so I walk in I, and Mike's leaving because he trains really early. Like yeah, you yeah. Do. I usually go and train with him when I go out there. Which yeah. is amazing for me yeah. because 4.30 his time is 7.30. Yeah, yeah you're like, yeah, yeah. I'm feeling great. <laughs> it's, not early, it's not early for me. Yeah. So I go to drive and, and train with him and, and Mike's leaving and Arnold's walking in and Arnold's talking to Mike for a minute. He introduces me and I'm like, oh, this is fucking great, right? So cool. And so he's like, I was like, what are you doing today? He's like, well, I don't, I don't do that much anymore, but I'll do some arms. And I'm like, you mind if I just do some arms with you? He goes, yeah, whatever. So I walk with him and I'm already tanked from training with Mike. Cause I try sure. to kick his ass. Yeah. You know how me and him compete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll do something pretty impressive and see if I can beat it. He's I fucking squats. strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the first time I tried going to the, the five twenty for 24. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Beating the Platts record or whatever, whatever the fuck you want to say. Um, I, Mike O'Hearn gets a hold of me about 2017. I'm still big. And he's like, how many times do you think you can do 500 on squats? I'm like, I don't know. I never fucking tried. He, <laughs> yeah. goes, he goes, give it a whirl. He goes, I'm going to try it tomorrow. You try it on your next leg day. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. That's their conversation. So yeah. <laughs> so I, I put 250 kgs on the side, which is 505 with yeah. the squat bar. I do 20, and I'm fucking hurting pretty yeah. bad because my GPP isn't that level. And uh, Mike gets like 18, and Stan tries it too and gets like 13. Wow. So now I beat him. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I was I was pretty pumped, but I was oh, like, yeah. So now everybody, I start hearing these rumors about this Tom Platt score sure. record. So I start looking it up and then I start. I asked Kaz about it because yep. me and Kaz are pretty good friends. That's cool. Kaz is like, it was fake as fuck. He goes, he goes, number one, it was at a WWF thing. Yeah. He goes, oh. so he goes, so, so there's, it one was on a stage, no right? That, okay. Yeah. I remember that. He yeah. Said, yeah. I, and so the next, he goes, the next problem is he had a fucking squat suit on. Oh, does he wear like a single yeah, fly or something? He was wearing a Z suit. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. And so I, was, I, was, I didn't care. Yeah. And I know his squat form is a lot different than mine. He does a very yeah, he's neat, super deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's short and yeah. he's little and he's built like an Olympic lifter, really. For sure. And so I don't squat that way. And I know yeah. that if I did that way, there's no way I would have a chance. So yeah. I kept putting it off a year here, a year there. And I was like, oh, I feel pretty good. I want to try it. And then something would come up. Like I'd have to talk somewhere. Yeah. And finally, like two months ago, I just said, fuck it. I'm doing it. I don't give a shit how many I get. Yeah. So I put a singlet on, I do my, my knee sleeves and pick it up and ended up getting 520 for 24 it's so good. at 42 years old, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I sent it to Kaz and Kaz was like, I'm fine. I'm glad you beat that motherfucker. Cause he doesn't like Platts at all. Got it. I guess Platts has a pretty bad attitude about a lot of shit. I don't know. Yeah. But so, so then, so then the next call I gets from Serrano. Yeah. And Serrano was like, glad you beat him too. Cause I guess Meadows had bad conflicts with got it Platts. he wanted to always train with Platts. Mm. meadows did and he finally did this is just rumor i don't know yeah, if it's true sure. but um i guess so meadows met up with Platts and trained with him for like a week <laughs> and they were they were hitting it off doing really well and he said Platts was everything i thought he was you know yeah. high intensity real cool guy yeah he said i get home and a week later i get a bill for ten thousand dollars in the mail for training with him mm -hmm. what and then he calls him. He's like, what's this all about? He goes, well, I taught you, you know, blah, 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 and whatever. And he goes, no, I'm not going to pay you 10 grand to come down there and train with you. And he said, Tom Platts never talked to him again. That's so weird. And I was like, that's fucking weird. So I was never a big Tom Platts fan. Oh, obviously the squat videos I thought were amazing. Yeah. But there's three, a lot of people know this. There's three versions of pumping iron book, like original versions. There's the version with Ed Corney on it, which yep. everyone's seen. There's a version with Arnold on it. And there's a weird version with Tom Platts on it. Mm -hmm. That's actually in color. And so I've kind of collect these things. And so I ended up with all three versions. Well, Ed just passed away, but I had his signature because he was always at the Arnold time oh, he's for 20 cool. bucks. Very cool, right? Arnold I obviously had because I worked with him and I made sure when I was working with him, I got it done. Tom Platts wasn't in anything, bro. I carried this book around <laughs> at every fucking Olympia, uh -huh. every Arnold Classic. And I run into his ass just in passing at the Olympia like three years later. And I'm like bothering him like, look, dude, I've been carrying this fucking book around for years. Finally run into his ass and he signed it. So I think I'm one of the only people that have all three versions. Probably. You know what yeah. I mean? That are actually signed. Probably. But the Tom Platts one was the fucking hardest one. Yeah, he's, he's kind of a recluse. But I, <laughs> exactly. I think for the reason being, you don't see him at those things. is because he asks people to pay him exorbitant amounts of money yeah. to show up. Because he thinks he's a legend. And he is. He is a certain legend. Small, it's just like anything else, though. Small circle legend. Yes, you're not a big circle legend. No. And so I, I just thought it was interesting. I had four or five people that I look up to call me and go, good thing you beat that motherfucker. And I was like, well, they were real weights. That, yeah. Anybody wants to come fact. and see him, I marked him. I'll show him to you. <laughs> I weighed so him all good. in, you know. So the point is, is like I, I was glad because it was another goal that I had yeah. to break. And uh, 
I felt that I did a really good job of doing it. it. It was weird though. My conditioning was so good. What really gave out was my, every muscle in my body. It was almost like the lactate was just yeah. so fucking high yeah. in my entire body. I just started to shut down Yeah. because when I racked it at 24, what you didn't see is I'm on the ground for 15 minutes. I can't move. Like I literally cannot fucking move. My body's in like full, like Shock. just <laughs> almost like death mode. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, man, I haven't felt that since that 1200 squat. <laughs> That's fucking you know? amazing. So I, I was, I was impressed to do that, but it was kind of one of those things where I was kind of like, all right, what's the, maybe not the last hoorah, but what's yeah. the one thing I can take to the fucking moon that I think, you know, cause what's his name? A couple guys just tried it and they couldn't even touch it. Hmm. You know, um, Joe Sullivan tried it, got yeah. 20 and got hammered. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other guys have tried it. So to hit 24 at 42 years old, bro, at six foot one, it's 500 pounds, bro. Yeah, five, <laughs> 520. You know, that's the other thing is like, well, well, well Tom Platt's at 20, 525. And I was like, who gives a fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's anything over 500 for that many <laughs> yeah. reps is insane. Insane. You know what I mean? So whatever. <laughs> well, Matt, um, first off, this is fucking amazing. This is awesome. It was, a, so, I learned a ton. I appreciate you sure. spending the time. Where can everybody find you at, bud? Well, um, you know, my website's winningstrength.com. We have online coaching where we customize everything. Oh, yeah. All the online coaches I have all have master's degrees or NFL experience. Oh, wow. That's sick. Or they've worked with humongous people. I'll give you an example. My other guy, Colton, that does online coaching, mm. he is the assistant track coach right now down south with the guy that they gave the medal for that beat Ben Johnson, oh, Carl wow. Lewis. Okay. He's working with Carl Lewis. The other guy's one of the head strength coaches at Kansas. The other guy played for the Dolphins and the Bengals and me. <laughs> Fuck yeah. That's, that's pretty strong. <laughs> that's the online coaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're really doing well with the equipment right now, The equipment's too. doing really well. The manuals are doing amazing. Yeah, yeah, um, And the manuals are everything that I have personally done with myself – and at least 100 people and all got positive results. Yeah, yeah. It's not like some theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a hypertrophy, power building, which is like a mixture. Sure. Kind of like how we train. Yeah, yeah, um, Pure power lifting. We have cutting manuals um, that got me down from 308 to 259 at like 11% oh, yeah. body fat a couple of years ago. So basically what I do is I'm like, I'm doing this anyway. Why not write it the fuck down? Yeah, I believe in that. And then I just basically go find my references and show people, hey, look, this is the smartest way mm -hmm. that I know how to train. Then the equipment, you know, we build the best belt squat. They're in a bunch of pro teams now. That's cool. Uh, we're at the uh, Lakers, the um, the Eagles, the Panthers, the Jaguars, the Bengals, just to name a few. Princeton has them. Kansas has them. Um, it's just yeah. to name a 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I fucking love it. <laughs> yeah. That's um, sick, bro. So with that, and then, you know, obviously we have some merchandise stuff, but we, yeah. don't, we don't do long, big lines of it. So I'll run a thing of shirts, sure. and when they're sold out, they're sold out. But – um, then we have the gym down in so real Matt winning at Instagram, Ludus Magnus gym also has a page. And then, um, you know, the website, winning strength, what's your YouTube, just Matt winning, uh, winning, winning, winning strength. strength. Okay. And that has three, that's where I think there's a ton of value yeah. to 50 videos. Listeners. Yeah. So anybody gets on there and watch, just leave some comments and subscribe because oh, yeah. we're really trying to help. And I truly believe by watching and obviously it's mine, so I'm biased, but the YouTube videos we have on there are fucking blowing everybody away. It's just a matter of time for people find the library. Yeah, because every time a new guy gets on there, like, holy shit. You well, know? there's a lot of dumb information out there For right sure. now. It's my people are being mind bad. blown, uh, especially like I'm, I'm I'm trying my TikTok right now, trying to add some value. <laughs> and people, there's a ton. Dude, it's so bad. There, it's, there's there's a lot of opportunity for us right now. Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Half a half a brain and experience. And yeah. You're already ahead of 99 percent of the people on the fucking Internet. Yeah. You know it's unbelievable. Mean? All right. Roundtable podcast. Corey G. Small Arms Danny at Trace Speed and the graphic gangster himself. Cole Susak. Appreciate you, Matt. Yep. We are out.